In the mid to late 1800s, the Hikaria tribe of the Apache Nation battled for their existence and rights over their lands in New Mexico. Pushed onto the high dry plateau of the Archuleta Mesa, they came across caverns leading deep underground and within they encountered non-human inhabitants. A battle ensued. Let's explore this. Hi everyone, and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. So how do we know this? It began in 1938, when FDR was made aware of the Nazi development in rocket science, as well as the progress on nuclear weapons. As a result, a first-of-its-kind Special Forces mission was put together to scout for suitable testing grounds in the sparsely populated areas of northern New Mexico, north of Alamogordo, mostly inhabited by Apache tribes, the Hikaria people. This is where Los Alamos was soon to be established, but not until FDR, encouraged by Albert Einstein and nuclear physicist Leo Zillard, assigned the task of building a research center for nuclear technology, choosing a physicist named Lyman Briggs to head up a newly formed Uranium Committee, our future Atomic Energy Commission. Roosevelt further assigned the Army Corps of Engineers the task of finding the suitable location for building secret facilities and testing of the technology far away from population centers and secure enough for all involved, sworn into secrecy, to work where no news could be leaked to potential adversaries. The search for suitable location became known as the Murak Expedition, so-called because they departed from the Murak Army Airfield in California, a first-of-its-kind Special Forces mission that included geologists, archaeologists, structural engineers, soldiers, sharpshooters, trackers, climbers, along with support and logistics team and equipment. As they headed to the 9,000 foot high plateau of the Archuleta Mountains of New Mexico. Let's remember that the 9,000 feet elevation, higher than most mountains, the air is thin, breathing is heavy, and the stamina to walk, climb, and fight severely limits the unaccustomed. What they found in 1940 was unexpected entryways into deep and enormous natural caverns underneath the Archuleta Plateau that separates New Mexico and Colorado, and what was even stranger, the caverns looked to be constructively modified. What they found would shake everyone involved to the core. But they stuck to their training and followed their mission by documenting everything, gathering data, removing artifacts, and writing reports, a testament to incredible resolve and discipline, and that this first Special Forces team was correctly put together for the unexpected task at hand. What they reported finding was a complex of multiple floors, miles deep, with hallways and hangars, cathedral in height and as many as seven levels, with the uninhabited upper levels equipped with unrecognizable gadgets and machinery for 1940 standards, stunning and confusing to the team as they could not comprehend, but partly, what they were looking at. They saw things they described as giant televisions and typewriters. We would know today as computer screens and control rooms with keyboards, multiple flat screens, towering memory drives and energy storages, each connected with cables, all of it unfamiliar to the Murak expedition team at the time. Additionally, they discovered control rooms with multiple workstations and they mysteriously looked too small for adult humans. Instead, they looked like incredibly sophisticated workstations, the likes they had never seen before or understood at the time, but as if designed for children. This was before they encountered the bodies. They wrote down every detail, as well as their impressions, including that this all looked incredibly sophisticated and high-tech, beyond anything known in their present time of 1940, but yet it was dusty, with rock and gravel crumble on top and webs of incest completely engulfing some equipment. It was as if this whole place and everything in it had been there for decades, if not hundreds of years, undisturbed 
and unused, and they still wondered if it could be a German spy base in the middle of New Mexico, consistent with the mindset of the time. They first had thoughts the screens were windows, but all they could see was their own reflection, and they were razor thin. Thick black cables ran along the floor with hair thin threads packed inside, emitting faint light on the white, green, and blue spectrum, and they looked like they'd been severed hastily, perhaps with knives, yet still pulsating light as if receiving or transmitting electricity, they thought, in 1940. They were fiber optics and computer control rooms, walls covered with plasma screens not invented yet, or yet to be reverse engineered. The expedition wondered about the equipment's power source and why this futuristic and clearly highly advanced technological base looked like it had been abandoned for perhaps hundreds of years. It was highly contradictory to their sense of logic. Among these technological wonders, something stranger yet was about to come to light. Knives, leather-wrapped handles, pieces of clothing, headbands, and arrows, hundreds of them. This addition, mixed in with the ancient high technology, was what looked like a random late 18th century museum of Native American battle gear, including dozens of Colt revolvers and Winchester rifles known to be possessed by the Hickorio Apaches in the late 1800s, and they were still in perfectly usable condition, lying about along with spent as well as unspent ammunition, weapons and ammunition with manufactured dates traceable to the 1870s Everything seemed out of place to the expedition team. Nothing made sense. Deeper inside the caves, they found the bodies. Human remains at first, wearing Apache warrior clothing, not modern 1940s type, but circa 1860 to 80. The commanding officer wrote in the report, what were Apaches doing here in the 1800s? Who were they fighting and for what reason? After this, they retreated back to the surface set up camp and slept the night without incident. The next day, daring deeper, they came across tablets written on metal depicting hieroglyphs of unknown origin, later to be found to be partly matching cuneiform writing of Old Sumeria, first discovered in Mesopotamia in the 1840s, assigned to the Akkadians and later to be suggested by Sitchin to be the writings of the Anunnaki. They looked the same, only more complicated. Tablets after tablets showing more sophisticated versions of cuneiform writing etched into metal found in caves deep within the Archuleta Mesa in New Mexico, North America. The deeper they went, the second level was less natural. Rocky cave walls gave way to smooth like granite looking stone walls and perfectly smooth and even floors, covered with similar slab of granite marble concrete and clean as if polished yesterday in stark contrast with the dusty upper levels. They noted the walls seemed to have liquid illuminant properties mixed in, providing a dim lighting to these underground halls and hallways. When they pushed against the wall, their handprints remained until they faded. They could write on it, and it stayed lit for a second. They had never seen such material before. On this edge of two worlds, at an intersection of natural caves and fabricated dwellings, it looked like a fierce firefight had occurred, with casualties on both sides, dozens of them. This is where they found the remains of the others, the inhabitants, small-sized, humanoid-looking creatures with disproportionately large heads and large eye sockets, some with arrows lodged into their bodies, decomposed, mummified. The size of the workstations on the upper floors began to make sense. Little by little, with every step they took, they were beginning to realize the magnitude of their findings. There's lots to unpack here. Not just the battle between aliens and Apaches in the 1870s, but everything we have since learned about this technology, the inhabitants, their origins, the reverse engineering, Roswell's proximity, and so much more. Decades later, including in our modern times, second and third decades of the 21st century, whistleblower accounts have since come forth regarding this base and the discoveries that were made that time in 1940 and for decades since. They include people that were assigned to work there temporarily or long-term and emergency responders tasked with sorting out future battles that were yet to take place with the inhabitants and the 1940 team encountered in the days that followed. 
people like Paul Benowitz and Phil Snyder, all of which have deceased under questionable circumstances since their disclosure. And there's the identified as Colonel X Anonymous, the interview topic of an infamous book that would become a must read entitled UFO Highway by Anthony Sanchez, published in 2010. I'll leave a link below on how to obtain it. All independent accounts agree in principle on timeline, internal description, function of the facility, its age, and most importantly, its inhabitants, their purpose and pursuit, as well as their own relations to them. Collectively, they paint a rather shocking picture of human-alien relations and agendas, but also explain so much so comprehensively. They provide an enormous wealth of information, all of which must be covered in future episodes. Not just the Hopis and the Navajos, but also the Apaches apparently, and their tribes, all have stories of interactions with alien presence on Earth. And it is incredibly detailed, consistent, in particular this story we are covering here today. Stories of beings descending from the sky, demons living within the Earth, and lights seen in the sky, and disappearing into the mountains. If you traveled to Dulce, New Mexico today, a town bearing the name of Sweets, you'd find that every living Hickory Apache, all 2,800 of them, have seen a UFO over the Mesa, and many have seen them several times and continue to see them on a regular basis, traversing up and down the state, around Dulce, the Archuleta Plateau, San Antonio, New Mexico, Aztec, Farmington, Roswell, and Los Alamos, coming out of and disappearing into the Archuleta Mesa and its mountain range. Let's go back to when the Hikario Apaches were dwindling in numbers and their land was being overtaken by white settlers and the U.S. military, arriving in droves since the U.S. annexation of New Mexico in 1848. Their numbers dipped below 1,000 before the turn of the century, as they were hunted down and killed for simply protecting their land and fighting back for a way of life, the right to survive the onslaught of outsiders invading their land. The reality of the events I describe are not only supported by the whistleblowers from within, but are upheld by two historic facts converging on the 1870s and 80s, correlating with the Muruk expedition findings. This has not been linked to the cave battle of aliens in Apaches before, as far as I can tell. But at the time, the Hikarios, to other Apaches, were known as fierce fighters, with their chief Garfield claiming 10 white lives for every one life lost to the tribe. But he also knew and stated they would ultimately be outnumbered because the influx of whites seemed limitless, and it was a fulfillment of their prophecy. They were ultimately met with the Northern Army in 1854 and lost, after which they were forcefully settled under a Maxwell Grant in the northernmost regions of New Mexico on a small part of their own original lands. You will now see how precisely known history is beginning to match with the cave findings in 1872 that an attempt was made to relocate the remaining Hikorio by force away from northeastern New Mexico to the west, and they themselves ventured out looking for suitable areas, including to the Archuleta Mesa, right there between 1872 and 1876. They were ultimately granted rights to a settlement in the northwest part of the state, now the home of the reservation, including their town of Dulce, established in 1877. As they were driven into the northwest corner of the state, their vanguard warriors, armed with knives, arrows, Colt revolvers, and Winchester rifles, were forced to scour the dry high plateau for suitable settlements for the remainder of the tribe. Perhaps as many as 100 fierce soldiers coming across these mysterious caves, and within them they unexpectedly encountered humanoids, greys, who fought back with weaponry unknown to the Apaches. Yet, the record shows within the caves they fought bravely and killed many of their opponents armed with sophisticated laser guns that blasted holes into their bodies and heads. The stories of the cave findings and those battles lived on in the memory of the Hikorio Apache tribe, and those that are entrusted with that information receive it from the highest authority within the tribe, with only a selected few hearing it firsthand from the elders, because it is the oral inheritance of their history, their ancestors, 
and to them it is holy and sacrilegious were it to be just evolved for sensation and fascination. Other battles have raged in the Dulce Archuleta Mesa, also known as the Rio Ox Complex. To this day, it remains a military no-fly zone by the Federal Aviation Administration. And so we continue to connect the dots, building a map of our collective history and mind-expanding dimension of time and space on a scale of destiny. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, the place for the exploration of all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.